On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Historically, baptism of the Holy Spirit is integral to those initiatory sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, which are constitutive of the church. In this sense, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is normative. Today I'd like to continue our series on baptism in the Holy Spirit by examining it in the history of the church. So when we read the Acts of the Apostles and the New Testament letters, we can see easily that the Pentecost experience of the Holy Spirit is filling the whole life of the early church. Now some have speculated that this experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit was only for the time of the Apostles in order to launch the church. They believe that the charisms of the Holy Spirit were only for that early church time. And now that they're no longer necessary, so God doesn't give them anymore. This particular idea has actually been firmly rejected by the teaching of the Catholic Church. In fact, in the most recent official teaching of the church at Vatican II, we read from the reception of these charisms, even the most ordinary ones, there arises for each of the faithful the right and the duty of exercising them in the church and in the world for the good of men and the development of the church, of exercising them in the freedom of the Holy Spirit who breathes where he wills, quoting John 3, 8. Note that the church teaches that it's not only a right to exercise charisms, but a duty to exercise them in the freedom of the spirit, to let the spirit blow where he wills. So that means that the charisms are not just for one point in the church's history, but in the whole history of the church. So let's look at that history, starting with the early church, and we'll move on to the medieval period, and finally, we'll look at the modern era. Now the early church is characterized by the writings of the church fathers. These are the major teachers of the faith, beginning with church fathers who knew the apostles. They're called apostolic fathers. And then it moves on through the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up into generally ending at around the eighth century. So the Catholic faith has been fleshed out by the writings of these church fathers. Now there are two Catholic theologians who have examined the writings of these fathers and looked for evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit in their writings. Father Killian McDonnell and Father George T. Montague made this exhaustive study of baptism in the Holy Spirit in the scriptures and then in the church fathers in a book entitled Christian Initiation and Baptism in the Holy Spirit, Evidence from the First Eight Centuries. They summarized their findings saying the following, the church fathers provide evidence of a broad pattern of expectation of charisms and the dynamic action of the Holy Spirit during Christian initiation. What does that mean? That in baptism, in confirmation, and in receiving the Eucharist for the first time, there was an expectation in the early church that the Holy Spirit would give charisms, gifts of the Holy Spirit, right in the liturgy. This pattern extends across various cultures, languages, geographical areas, ecclesiastical traditions in the East and in the West. So they write that baptism in the Holy Spirit was a synonym for Christian initiation. This is true for Justin Martyr, for Origen, for Cyril of Jerusalem. In fact, church fathers such as Tertullian, Hilary of Poitiers, Cyril of Jerusalem, and John Chrysostom they clearly regarded reception of charisms as integral to Christian initiation. Their testimony demonstrates that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a matter of private piety, but of the official liturgy of the church's public life. Historically, baptism of the Holy Spirit is integral to those initiatory sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, which are constitutive of the church. 
In this sense, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is normative. Now, this is a very strong statement theologically, and I encourage you to to look up that book I just mentioned and, and view the evidence for yourselves. But I'm just going to summarize some of the key witnesses to the faith that they quote in their study. Now, we have to remember that in the early church, most converts were pagans who were becoming Christian as adults. So when a new Christian was baptized, it was expected that they would be experiencing baptism in the Holy Spirit and receiving charisms because they were having an adult level reception of the sacrament of baptism or the sacrament of confirmation. So let's look at the writings of a few of these church fathers in some detail. Let's start with Saint Clement of Rome. He lived in the, the time of the turn of the, from the first century into the second century, around 88 to 100 AD. He was the fourth pope. He had been a disciple of Saint Paul and of Saint Peter. He knew them both personally. He insisted that the whole Christian community must experience a full outpouring of the Holy Spirit if it is to witness to the risen Lord. But he also insisted that we need true repentance and reconciliation in our lives if we want to experience the Holy Spirit and his gifts. So it's not an either or, it's a both and. Repentance, faith in Christ, and then receiving the Holy Spirit in his fullness. Another early witness to the faith was Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. He lived from 130 AD to 200. He was a disciple of Saint Polycarp, who himself was a disciple of the Apostle John. So he's kind of two steps removed from the apostles, if you will. Now Saint Irenaeus spoke of charisms as manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He insisted that each Christian must receive and use their gifts. He taught that the Holy Spirit is constantly bringing new life and renewal to the community and to all Christians to overcome this darkness and evil in the world. In one of his most famous and most quoted writings against heresies, he writes, we hear of many members of the church who have prophetic gifts and by the Spirit speak with all kinds of tongues and bring men's secret thoughts to light for their own good, and expound the mysteries of God. So this is an example of the charisms of speaking in tongues, of prophecy, of perhaps word of knowledge and teaching being exercised. Moving on a little bit later, St. Clement of Alexandria in 150 to 216 AD, one of the great fathers of the church made it very clear that the Holy Spirit has to lead all the activities of missionaries and evangelists. He taught that if the gifts of all Christians are not exercised, it's like imprisoning the Holy Spirit. He further said that the signs of the Christian community should be healing, prophecy, and deliverance. These are the signs that the kingdom of God is overcoming the God of this age, the devil. Moving still later into the fourth century of the church, Saint Hilary of Poitiers, a bishop of Poitiers in France, and also a doctor of the church, wrote in his tract on the Psalms about baptism as an experience of intense joy when we feel the first stirrings of the Holy Spirit and where we are inundated with the gifts of the Spirit, the charisms. Finally, we have Saint Augustine of Hippo, who is probably one of the greatest known church fathers, writing in the late fourth and early fifth centuries. He spoke of charisms in his time as well. He even describes what he calls jubilation, which is similar to what we now call singing in the spirit or singing in tongues in the modern charismatic renewal. John of Apamea, in the first half of the fifth century, he's from the Syrian tradition in the east, writes of actually two baptisms, the second which actualizes the first. In the second baptism, one takes possession perfectly of the power of the Holy Spirit of, in baptism. Now, if we move from this early church era into the medieval era, we actually see a change 
in the writings of uh, church theologians. We see at the end of the fourth century a decline in the use of the charisms. Now many theologians have proposed reasons for this decline, different ideas of why this change occurred. So here are a few possible reasons. First of all, there was a lack of theological reflection on the Holy Spirit in the early church. The focus was mainly on the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who Jesus is, his identity, encountering many different heresies that kept cropping up. There was Arianism denying the full divinity of Christ. There was Apollinarianism and so on and so forth. So the church councils of this time around the fourth and fifth century were almost exclusively focused on Christology, the theology of Christ, and therefore less on the person of the Holy Spirit, and that development came later. A second reason, possible reason, for the decline of the charisms was an overreaction to something called Montanism. Now, Montanists were very much into the Holy Spirit and use of the charisms, but they were not willing to submit to the authority of the church. They exaggerated the importance of the charisms, especially of prophecy and, and a private revelation directly from God. And they said that that trumped apostolic authority, the authority of the bishops, even the authority of the word of God. So there was a real fear of using charisms in that time of the Montanists because they, they were afraid that we would, uh, people would follow the errors of these Montanists in their disobedience to church authority. A third reason for the decline was there was a separation of the experience of Pentecost from the experience of baptism through the prevalence of infant baptism. Keep in mind that in the early church, it was primarily adults being baptized, but by the fourth and fifth century, most of the Western world was already evangelized. So most new Christians were babies. So the expectation of receiving an experience of awakening disappeared because you don't really expect that uh, from an infant in infant baptism. Fourthly, there was an association of prophetic gifts almost exclusively with the hierarchy of the church. So the idea was that charisms were just for those who had uh, been ordained or who were uh, in the hierarchy. Another thing that happened was some theologians didn't see the gifts operative in the, in the church, so they kind of theologized or rationalized that, that the preaching of the bishop was the prophetic word, or the charism of healing was just the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that only priests could perform. A fifth change that happened was that charisms were viewed as restricted to the heights of holiness and the, the monks and the, the religious of the day. This was a false idea that only holy people get gifts. The rank and file cr Christian wouldn't receive them. And I think we're still fighting with this to some degree in the church today, this, this misconception of the use of gifts. Finally, and this might have been even more important than some of the ones previous, there was a successful evangelization of the West, uh, of Europe. And that meant that the gifts were not as needed during the time of expansion and the confrontation with paganism that occurred previously. If you think about it, when do you see the gifts most active and powerful, especially these sign gifts that are very dramatic? Well, it's during evangelization. It's when you're confronting paganism, when you're confronting other belief systems, that's when you see these power encounters where you tend to see the more dramatic gifts in operation, such as miracles and deliverance. There's a manifestation of power to show people who the real God is. As St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we do not preach the word of God with word only, but in the power and in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So when the church is expanding, when it's taking ground for the kingdom of God, you will see more of these power sign gifts operating. Now the other gifts were still active, but often they were, we would fail to recognize them because they're not so dramatic. Nevertheless, the charisms did not disappear from the experience of the church altogether. If we look at the medieval time of the church, in certain places we see revival of the use of charisms. 
We can see this in, in evidence of this in the lives of many saints. One classic example is in Thomas of Solano's account of the canonization of St. Francis of Assisi. When the Holy Spirit fell in a dramatic fashion, he writes, after singing the Te Deum, there was raised a clamor among the many people praising God. The earth resounded with their mighty voices. The air was filled with their jubilations. New songs were sung and the servants of God jubilated in melody of the Spirit. So there's a spontaneous outbreak of praise of God and singing in the Spirit right in the middle of the canonization liturgy for St. Francis of Assisi. Another example is in the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila, who describes several accounts of this jubilation or singing in the Spirit, and she likened it to spiritual inebriation, being drunk in the Holy Spirit. She writes, many words are spoken during this state in praise of God, but unless the Lord himself puts order to these words, they have no orderly form. The understanding at any rate counts for nothing here. The soul would like to shout praises aloud. The soul utters a thousand holy follies, striving ever to please him who thus possesses it. So many of the great spiritual writers over the centuries have spoken at length about the charisms and their use. So contrary to what some Christians have thought, Christians have experienced baptism in the Holy Spirit and the exercise of charisms in every age of the church. Now in our next teaching, we'll examine baptism in the Holy Spirit in the modern era, in the experience of charismatic renewal. This has been the second segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul VI identifies in the movement of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And this movement of the Holy Spirit is not limited in any sense to the, the bounds of the visible Catholic Church, but a wave of renewal that embraces all Christian denominations. Sometimes we hear people say, like, if God is real, why doesn't he just reveal himself? Like, why, why is God hiding? If God is real, why doesn't he just show himself so that we can all see and believe in him and that will settle things? And the truth is, is that God is not only not hiding himself, it is God who is seeking us. God is seeking us and we don't even realize it. God is, is, is calling us. God is calling us through, through many means. He calls us through the beauty of nature. He calls us through, through our relationships. He calls us through our conscious, conscious. He calls us through the circumstances of life, through, through, through uh, our, our spiritual leaders. God is constantly trying to draw us to himself. And oftentimes, we don't recognize the Lord. You know, St. Augustine tells us that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And St. Paul talks about this in the Acts of the Apostles when he was preaching in Athens to the Athenians. He says to them, he's speaking of God, and he made from one every nation that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said. And so God is not far from us. In him we live and move and have our being. And again, God is, is seeking us. It's kind of like in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is describing 
the love of God. And he uses the image of, uh, of the woman who loses a coin. She has ten coins, she loses one. So she lights a lamp, she sweeps out her whole house until she finds that coin. And when she finds the coin, she, she rejoices. Or he gives the parable of the man who has a hundred sheep. And he loses one of those sheep. And what does he do? He leaves the 99 and he goes and he seeks the lost sheep. And when he finds the sheep, he rejoices. And so again, the Lord, who is closer to us than we are to ourselves, He is seeking us. He is calling us. Now, at the same time, it is true that as the Lord seeks us, He does veil Himself in a way. And it's kind of like I heard of a college down in the U.S., uh, Steubenville, that is known for its good Catholic students. There's a lot of good Catholic students who go to Steubenville, Steubenville University. And therefore, it, it's, it's known that there's a lot of uh, wealthy young men who go study to Steubenville in order to hopefully find a good Catholic wife. And I'm told that it's typical for these wealthy young men to, to before they go to, to Steubenville to college to study, they sell their fancy BMW and their fancy clothing and they, they move into Steubenville with an old secondhand Honda and, you know, college clothing. So they blend in and look like everyone else. They don't want to, to flaunt their wealth. Why? Well, it's obvious. They want to find a, a girl who will love them not because of their wealth or their BMW or whatever else, but because of, of who they are, to, to fall in love with the person, not the possessions. And it's the same thing with the Lord our God. He wants us to discover Him. He wants us to notice Him, but not simply because of His, His majesty and glory and might, but because simply of who He is, our, our, our Creator, our, our Abba, Father. And so He could. He could reveal to us the full glory of His majesty and we would all fall on our knees and we would worship. But there would be a lack of freedom if God were to arrange things in that way. And so the way uh, it's explained or the, the way we understand uh, God and His revelation to us is it's, it's said that God, He hides Himself enough so that those who are not seeking Him won't find Him. But God reveals Himself enough so that those who are seeking Him, they will find Him. And that reminds us, of course, of the well-known scripture from, from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, where Jer Jeremiah, uh, the Lord says through Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will find Him. And I can testify this to this in my own life. When I was a teenager, I used to be an atheist. But I, I, at one point in my life, I began to seek the Lord with all my heart, and I found Him. I know He's real. I, I, I encountered Him. And so if you are seeking God, if you are not sure whether or not God is real, know that He can be found. But you must seek Him with all your heart. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to seek the Lord with all your heart? Because if you do, you will find Him. We count it such a privilege to join you in prayer. Many requests come to our office each week and we pray over each one faithfully. Although we can't acknowledge each one in writing personally, we faithfully pray and stand with you in your prayers. We would also invite you to write in when you have an answer to prayer. Sometimes the answer that you have can just give a word of hope to someone who's still waiting on God for their prayer to be answered. And wherever you're at, whatever circumstance you're going through, we encourage you to remain steadfast in prayer. Colossians 4.2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Wherever you're at, whatever you're experiencing, it's important to remember to thank God even in the midst of the trial. That might sound a little odd. My husband and I have been beset with many trials and one of the key words that my, my husband felt the Lord saying was, keep thanking me, keep praising, keep 
praying to me. We must always be thankful, even in the midst of the trial. And the truth is, is that even in that challenge that we're experiencing, God has a plan and has a purpose. I think of Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 11, one of my favorite passages of scripture. It says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me, and you will find me, when you search for me with all your heart. There's nothing like a trial to bring us to that place of really searching for God. I know that as I've gone through many challenges and and trials, it's in those times that I really do seek God with all my heart. And God is there for us, and He will let us find Him and experience His presence and His comfort. And it is through continuing to pray, worshiping and praising Him through the trial, and giving thanks that we can find perfect peace. You know, the good news is that we don't have to have smooth sailing in our lives to enjoy peace. Peace can be ours even in the midst of trials because God is the one who gives us that peace. I think of Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, another favorite passage of mine. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You can have his peace in the midst of it all. One day as I was praying, and I've been praying a long time for a certain request, and and the Lord just hasn't answered it yet, I remember feeling discouraged. And we do go through those times of feeling discouraged. And I said to the Lord, I just need a little indication from you that you're working, just a little sign. And God is so faithful to do that if we just ask him. And then out of the blue, the phone rang, and a dear friend of mine who serves on the board of directors of Food for Life said, you know, Kathy, I was thinking about you today, and I want to tell you something. God's delay is not his denial, and that's key for all of us to remember. Just because the answer to prayer doesn't come immediately, and we all know that our prayers don't always get answered immediately, it doesn't mean that he's denying you the request. God just has his perfect way and his perfect timing of bringing that request to pass. So continue to pray, remain steadfast. If we can pray with you, we're glad to do that. But most of all, place your trust in God who loves you with an everlasting love. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1404 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul VI identifies in the movement of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And this movement of the Holy Spirit is not limited in any sense to the the bounds of the visible Catholic Church, but a wave of renewal that embraces all Christian denominations. This has been the second segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8.